So we're getting together yeah. today to talk about the invention of a new drink, which is called Lambrucha, and we have Don Feinberg and Roger Musa here. Uh, Roger's from Belgium, Don is from the States, to talk about how this came about. Well, Roger, you remember when I called you and I said that I had this very, I thought, maybe crazy idea, but that I had tried Lambic by itself, and that my wife had introduced me to kombucha, which is a fermented tea. And I immediately upon tasting kombucha, I said, it reminds me of Lambic. And then I checked the label, and in fact there was on the side a description of the yeast they used, and they said that they used a Brettanomyces, which as you know is yeah. a Lambic yeast. So I made a quick sort of melange in my in kitchen, kitchen yeah. yeah, and I tried it, and I thought it was really excellent. But of course, as you know, there, from an idea to an actual product that you can bottle and ship from Belgium to America, and, um, and I said I needed your help. And as one of the leading experts on Lambic yeast and on how Lambics are made, I knew I needed your help because I was worried that maybe putting these two things together I'd get an explosion fighting, instead of a product. Fighting with each other. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I think it, one of the things I'd love to know from you is when you heard the idea, what your concerns were and whether you thought it uh, immediately no problem or whether you thought, yeah, that could be an issue. Or the concern was in fact that uh, if we mix afterwards the two, the two blends, the two brews together, and do a further fermentation was always how far will that ferment? Mm -hmm. How far is, is the lambic better mices ferment attenuated? Right. How far is the kombucha? Because so the sweetness I had in my kitchen might disappear, for example. Yeah, yeah. So it can first it disappeared, it, it will be sour, more sour, and otherwise the, the danger was if we do the refermentation and there is an excess of sugar left, you have an explosion yeah. in, in the bottle. So that was the the, the biggest problem. Second was also finding a small brewery with capacity because all the, the bigger ones are full, full, full right. and finding the, the right lambic and the right kombucha. Right. Well, my concern after that when you when we talked about the aspect of the brewery, of course, was we also needed to be able to taste the kombuchas, taste the lambic yeah. and make a blend that we felt would work together because it's not just simply lambic and kombucha, it's a kind of lambic that has certain characteristics that I was looking for, and the same thing with the kombucha tea. We had to actually get it made by. Um, uh, I, I hoped to have an organic producer, so you found one for us, yeah. which was fantastic. But uh, I think one of the great exciting things is that we that we were able to put two living beverages together. Like to my knowledge, it's the first time we have a living drink mixed with another completely different kind of living drink to make a third completely new living Working drink. Working further on the living yeast, uh, yeast ferments in the yeah. two and make them the marriage of the hybrid and do further fermentation in, in the barrel. So, so how, well I think the question is, how, so how long was our project and, and how long did the project take us? So from start to me calling you to being here in America, that's really two years practically. Minimum two years, yeah. Because big, remember we did a test brew. And yeah. Because we, we need uh, uh, the right lambic of minimum nine months. Otherwise, you have residual sugars in. It's not fermented enough, etc. And you need uh, the, com the complex um, fermentation stadia, starting from the bacteria and the wild, the wild yeast, the culture yeast, the lactobacillus. So and that's it, minimum nine months. And in this bottle, what we have actually is we have year old lambic. Yeah. And we also have uh, the kombucha. But I remember also one of the things I think Wendy would like to know or people might be, find interesting is that when I came up with that idea, I came to you and we had to do that test batch, which actually was good, but very, very, very sour yeah. and very severe. Uh, and then when we shipped it, I was concerned that we might get a, too much precipitation or the yeast might die on the trip over. And, and actually, you could explain that to me. I was worried that we might get roping in the beer. You know, pediococcus rope, you know, sort of that, those yeah, long, but, long protein strings. But that's the big advantage of, of both drinks. Both have uh, the wild, the wild uh, better mices inside, but they have different better mices. So in, in the lambic, so to avoid the ropeness, you need better mices and low amount of pediococcus. So, but we are very lucky. In in the lambic, you have a, the better mices, well, no, the Bruxelliensis, Lambrucha, mm -hmm. we have the, the Lambicus, but in the, in the, 
in de zwam, in de, in de mushroom of de slimy ball of ja, everything, ja. how, how you call it, it's very difficult to, to say, <laughs> it's plenty of, of Brettanomyces, but different ones, mm -hmm. clustery, clausy, and anomalies, so different Brettanomyces, because it's coming from another world, and even there's, in some articles they said, there's a a, a bet, an unknown Betanomyces in Kombucha. In the Kombucha, and it's main, mainly the new name will be there in Mongolia, because the original the the, komb the Kombucha is coming from Mongolia. Yeah, from the steppes. Right? Yeah. yeah the, so, so that was I was I was not afraid of of, of our, uh, about Rupnis because it was um, plenty of Betanomyces, plenty, plenty. And one of the things I noticed when I put my little uh, version in my kitchen together was that I was able to make kombucha taste and smell more complex because kombucha can have a sort of simplistic almost apple cider vinegar quality. Thin, thin, quite thin. It's thin on the tongue, yeah. it has an apple cider quality, it also uh, smells quite, sh you know, sort of a sharp sour sweetness. And I thought, I thought we could make that more sophisticated by adding lambic, which has many more, I think, sort of profound smells and aromas. And then I was hoping that uh, the kombucha would actually make the lambic a little softer, a little more accessible, a little less demanding. So for me, when I came, and you know we did those tests, and you know that you were saying to me constantly, Don, it must be drinkable. Yes, <laughs> not, not vinegar. Not I vinegar. Say always that. Yes. And, 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 and we yeah. argued back and forth about whether or not it was too, too simple or too, or, or too sharp. Yeah, I think what we've succeeded, at, what I'm most happy about, uh, is how soft uh, it has a, a real sort of what we say in English a tanginess or a, a kind of a kind of um, sourness, but it doesn't have any of that sharp bite in the back. Is the, the, lact is a, the lactic? We are making lactic acid like in yogurt, and there's a very drinkable acidity. Yeah, yeah. If you go to sour sour, then you have more acetic acid yeah. like in vinegar. Right. So you must avoid that. And some lambics have that actually have too much acetic acid. Yeah. My feeling is personally having. Uh, been in the beer business now for 30 years, it's the most cleansing, refreshing, palate cleansing uh, beer I've ever, ever drank because it's really, it, it doesn't so much as uh, assault your tongue with sourness, but it just really cuts through any fats or any any kind of heavy flavors from food and it just completely revitalizes your tongue. And some people said it's like a combination of, of the best cider that you can make and the champagne on beer basis. It's yeah. very, very strange. Yeah. And I think the thing is, I keep saying to people when they say, what does it smell like? I say, it smells like the best Lambic brewery. Because it really, you know in that Lambic brewery when you're, everything's getting cleaned and washed down, but you still have the great smells from the, from the barrels and from sort of the plaster walls. It's just, it's so fresh and, and really, it's almost like a tonic, uh, refreshing quality. And it's a combination, of course, of, the, of, of both, of both trends in taste and, uh, and in flavor. Yeah. It's, it's very and, and I've been very happy, it goes really well with, with food. I mean, I think I've been really thrilled with how it goes with cheeses and things like, we've had herring, but we've also had uh, other sort of cream-based stews that are just fantastic with it. And oyster. And oysters, yeah. Nice with seafood and oysters. And uh, the nice thing is uh, maybe that we invent uh, these days uh, quite a uh, hundred uh, percent new way of fermentation. Uh, you have uh, the lava fermentation, uh, what we call the bottom, the top fermentation, the spontaneous. You have the mixed fermentation, and here we, I think we have a hybrid uh, fermentation, yeah. unique in the world, because we go further with two peers in fermentation. We have the combination, the hybrid, it makes a new product, then we do a refermentation. So it's a, yeah. a long process and I think unique. And certainly unique because we've married two, uh, not two beers in fact, but one beer, a, re a yeah. fermented beer and a fermented tea and, and they, we put them together and they fell in love. We didn't know that they were going to do sure. what they did, but they really yeah. have come together to make a, a, yeah. a, a beautiful, as you said, third product. Okay. Thank you, Roger Chin. Chin, thank you for the co collaboration and, and uh, working cheers. together. Mm. Pretty good beer. Or is it beer? No, it's, it's <laughs> a pretty good drink. Yeah. It's really lovely.